In 2018, one of the best-selling blood pressure drugs, Valsartan, sold as Divan, was found to be contaminated by the probably carcinogenic nitrosamine known as N-nitrosodimethylamine, or NDMA. It's believed that approximately 20 million people worldwide were prescribed the drug tainted with this contaminant, whose cancer risk has been shown to exceed that of many known potent carcinogens, including asbestos, benzoapyrene, and PCBs. The U.S. Food and Drug Administration estimated that taking the drug for a few years could cause cancer in as many as 1 in 8,000 people, whereas the European equivalent of the FDA estimated the cancer risk could be as high as 1 in 5,000. It is unlikely, researchers wrote in the spring 2019 paper, that drugs like Valsartan are a unique case, and indeed, a few months later, the FDA announced it had found NDMA in ranitidine. Ranitidine, the acid reflux drug sold as Zantac, is one of the most prescribed drugs on the planet, in addition to being sold over the counter. Give people a single tablet, and the amount of NDMA flowing through their bodies jumps up more than a hundredfold. Uh, then, in 2020, some formulations of metformin, a popular diabetes drug sold as glucophage, were found to be contaminated. The finding of NDMA in common medicines led the FDA to call for the immediate withdrawal of all Zantac from store shelves, yanking the drug from the market because their testing showed NDMA levels could, in some circumstances, exceed the acceptable daily intake limit of 96 nanograms per day. It was so bad that the FDA found levels of this carcinogenic contaminant NDMA in Zantac similar to the levels you would expect to be exposed to if you ate grilled or smoked meats. Wait, what? NDMA has not only been found in contaminating drugs, it is a known byproduct of pesticide manufacturing, leather tanning, and tire plants, and is found in multiple food and beverages, including processed meat and beer. Uh, now that we know NDMA can transfer through the placenta, this may explain the relationship between maternal cured meat consumption during pregnancy and the risk of childhood brain tumors. Uh, for example, hot dog consumption during pregnancy may increase childhood brain tumor risk by 33%, or sausage consumption by 44%. Baking consumption may increase childhood brain tumor odds by 60 or 70%. But it's not just processed meat. Researchers have found it in poultry products as well. A single serving of chicken contains more than 100 nanograms of NDMA. Remember how the FDA said the acceptable daily intake limit is 96 nanograms per day? Half of a chicken breast contains 110. Now, Raw poultry doesn't have any, it's the cooking process. In fact, the dry heat cooking of meat, like broiling or grilling, even creates airborne NDMA, releasing this very potent carcinogenic compound into the air. So even if you're only getting a salad or something in a charcoal grill restaurant, just being indoors where meat is being cooked could pose a significant cancer risk. These nitrosamines are also found in cigarette smoke, and pressure was put on the tobacco industry to try to remove them, arguing that there is simply no logical reason why a removable carcinogen should be allowed to remain in a consumer product. That's the same reason Zantac was yanked from store shelves. OK, so let me get this straight. One of the best-selling drugs in history was pulled from the market, a drug that brought in billions of dollars because it contained a probable carcinogen that exceeded the acceptable daily limit. But there may be more of the contaminant in a single serving of chicken. So my question is, why aren't they pulling the poultry off the shelves as well? The incidence of breast cancer is continuously increasing worldwide. In the U.S., this amount to a 40% increase in the incidence by the turn of the century. Currently, the main approach is early detection and treatment. Uh, that's important, but why not pay more attention to primary prevention? In other words, protecting people from being exposed to risk factors for breast cancer so they never develop breast cancer in the first place. Overall, it's estimated that 20% of all human cancers have an infectious origin. Uh, viruses can trigger cancer by turning on cancer genes or turning off cancer-suppressing genes, but they can also contribute to tumor formation just by causing chronic inflammation. Currently, 
cancer-causing viruses are considered the major plausible hypothesis for a direct cause of human breast cancer. How did we get here? It all started about 40 years ago, when a professor of virology at UC Berkeley learned how mouse mammary tumor virus was discovered. Scientists swamped baby mouse pups from mice with a high incidence of mammary cancer with pups from mouse strains with a low incidence, and found that the cancer incidence matched the foster mothers, showing it wasn't genetic. It occurred to me, the professor thought, that humans are foster-nursed on the cow. Bovine leukemia virus had just been identified as a cancer-causing cow virus. At the time, only about 1 in 10 U.S. dairy cows were infected, but now it's closer to half. We started out with two-thirds of herds affected, then it was more like 80% based on their milk testing positive for the virus, and 100% of the larger industrial farms. And now more than 9 out of 10 U.S. herds are affected, a continuation of the historical trend of the persistent proliferation of BLV within U.S. dairy herds. We've long known that countries with the highest milk consumption also had the highest breast cancer incidence. And it's not just a, a matchup between dairy consumption and breast cancer incidence on the country level. Individual women who are lactose intolerant and consume less dairy also seem to have decreased risk of breast cancer. Oh, but come on, there's lots of stuff in milk that could be contributing to cancer risk, like saturated fat and the presence of cancer-promoting growth hormones like IGF-1. Yes, we know bovine leukemia virus is present in marketed beef and dairy products. About half of milk and meat samples turn up positive for the virus. In fact, you could sample the virus straight out of the air on dairy farms, on surfaces, and in the milk itself. Uh, most milk is pasteurized, but many dairy products like raw aged cheeses are not. And who hasn't eaten a pink-in-the-middle hamburger at some point in their life? Yes, we have evidence that people are exposed to the virus. Yes, we have evidence that people are actively infected with the virus. But it wasn't until 2015 that we learned infection rates were highest in cancerous breast tissue, so much so that as many as 37% of breast cancer cases may be attributable to exposure to the bovine leukemia virus. That was enough for me to trigger a whole series of videos on the role the virus plays in breast cancer and how the meat and dairy industries responded to the news. OK, now that we're all back up to speed, what's the latest update? Uh, that's what I'll cover next. In 2015, researchers in California found bovine leukemia virus stitched into the DNA of human breast cancer tumors from mastectomies at such higher rates than was found in normal breast tissue taken from breast reduction surgery, that they calculated that as many as 37% of breast cancer cases may be attributable to bovine leukemia virus exposure, likely through the consumption of milk or meat obtained from infected animals. In response, the milk and meat industry seemed more concerned about consumer confidence than consumer cancer, but scientifically the research priority turned to could the California results be replicated? The answer, it turns out, was yes. They were replicated among women in Iran, replicated in Brazil. In Australia, the link was even stronger. In Texas, the same thing. Women diagnosed with breast cancer were found to be so much more likely to have bovine leukemia virus DNA in their breast tissue compared with women without cancer that the attributable risk was calculated at 51.82%, indicating that this meat and dairy virus could be responsible for at least one half of the breast cancer cases among the women in Texas they studied. All in all, six of the eight studies performed to date found the virus in human breast tissues, which suggests strongly that BLV does infect humans, and breasts can be targets of infection. And for the five studies that were able to compare infection rates in cancerous tissue versus normal breast tissue, found that the odds of finding the virus in the tumors was an average of four times higher. How does that compare to other breast cancer risk factors? If you go on hormone replacement for five years, you can bump up your breast cancer risk by 30%. If you take the pill for more than a dozen years, your risk may go up 40%. If you're obese when you're older, your risk can go up 60%. Having a first-degree relative with breast cancer may double your risk, but having your breast infected with bovine leukemia virus may quadruple your risk, increase your risk hundreds of percent. 
the only risk factors more potent than BLV infection were having uh, BRCA gene mutations like Angelina Jolie has, or, or a high dose of ionizing radiation like being in the wrong place at decidedly the wrong time. Beyond confirmation, one study suggested that older patients had a greater likelihood of testing positive for bovine leukemia virus. Um, that makes sense. I mean, if BLV is from exposure to dairy and meat, the older we get, the more meals we've had, and the more opportunities to become infected over time. Researchers also discovered that the virus comes first, uh, present in some breast tissues three to ten years before cancer was diagnosed. This argues against the idea of viral invasion of already malignant cells, quashing the theory that maybe the virus is somehow just attracted to the cancer after the fact. Could this explain the consistent findings that breast cancer tissue is more likely to harbor infection? Again, the data showed no, the virus appeared to come first. Now, this review doesn't provide absolute proof that BLV is a cause of breast cancer, but based on the best available balance of evidence, BLV infection does indeed appear to be a breast cancer risk factor. The latest revelation is it's now been found in human blood, too. Uh, this has a number of potential ramifications. Blood banks, for example, don't screen for it, so it's possible you can get it from consuming meat or dairy, or getting blood from someone who consumed meat or dairy. This could also mean that BLV could cause leukemia in people, too. I mean, a dozen chimpanzees. Two infant chimps were fed milk from cows naturally infected with BLV, and they both died of leukemia. We didn't even know chimps could get leukemia. This certainly suggests the possibility of transmission or induction of leukemia through the ingestion of milk from BLV-infected cows. Or blood-borne spread could carry the virus to other organs. In cattle, the virus causes blood cancers, but this may just be because dairy cattle are turned into hamburger when they're still so young, so maybe they don't have time for tumors to grow in other organs. How concerned should we be about bovine leukemia virus? It's not clear yet whether this is a good news story or a bad news story. I mean, if subsequent studies show that BLV does cause breast cancer in humans, this will have significant repercussions for the dairy and cattle industries, but that means there's something we can do about it. Uh, perhaps attempts should be made to eradicate the infection from cattle now rather than wait for the final word. 21 nations have eradicated BLV from their dairy cattle. In contrast, in the U.S., the BLV prevalence just keeps going up. If the industries are not going to step up and try to eliminate the disease, then the least they could do is eliminate some of the practices that spread the disease between animals. Uh, BLV is spread via blood through contaminated needles, saw or gouge dehorners, tattoo pliers, ear taggers, hoof knives, nose tongs, and other tools of the agribusiness trade. Though in view of the emerging information about BLV in human breast cancer, it may be prudent to encourage the complete elimination of BLV in cattle, particularly in the dairy industry. The hope is that either way it may help reduce the scourge of breast cancer. Yes, media messages surrounding nutrition are often inconsistent and confusing, but many Americans know what constitutes a healthy diet. I mean, does anyone really think drinking brown carbonated sugar water is good for them? At issue is that they don't appear to be translating their knowledge into action. There are a number of reasons people have such difficulty changing their dietary behaviors. While ignorance and confusion may play a part, the motivation to change is likely much more important. Uh, certainly we are living in a world that pushes us to eat whatever we want, regardless of the long-term consequences, but one of the major problems in getting people to change their behavior is the need to get them to recognize the need to change. For example, if you ask people how much meat they eat, or how much greasy food, eggs, sweets, alcohol, butter, they claim to be eating less than the average person. So if people think they're at less risk than others, they may dismiss advice to eat more healthfully, thinking that they already eat healthier. Maybe they are? No. People rated their own eating behavior as healthier on average, even when their actual eating habits were terrible. 
Uh, for this reason, maybe health-promoting campaigns need to make people aware of how badly they're eating. But when you do that, a strange thing happens. If you challenge people with the reality of what the average person actually eats, they change their answer to make themselves appear as though they're still healthier than average. When people's favorable comparisons on risky behaviors are threatened, they not only reduce their estimates of how often they engage in those behaviors— oh, I don't eat that much meat— but they also attenuate the significance of those behaviors. Meat's not that bad for you anyway. It's the same personal fable that smokers tell themselves. Studies show that smokers have a strong tendency to underestimate all smoking-related risks, uh, developing a series of illusions and false beliefs to support their choice to keep on smoking. Why do so many people continue to light up in spite of smoking's harmful effects to their health? For many of the same reasons people continue to eat unhealthy food. First, they convince themselves that they are less at risk than others who engage in the same behavior. And in addition to this optimism bias, smokers underestimate the extent to which smoking elevates lung cancer risk, thinking two-pack-a-day smokers only have like five times the risk of getting lung cancer when their actual risk is 20-fold higher. And anyway, many smokers believe lung cancer is mainly determined by one's genes. Many food-related hazards share the same optimistic bias, such as heart attacks and heart disease, are our number one killer, obesity, diabetes, and all the rest. People are often quite ingenious in finding reasons for believing that their own risk is less than the risk faced by their peers. So maybe public health advocates need to be just as ingenious in understanding the origins of this unrealistic optimism, and in finding approaches to help people gain a more accurate picture of their own vulnerability. All sorts of work is being done trying to reduce or eliminate this bias, but we must consider the possibility that reductions in optimistic bias may lead to reductions in self-esteem and psychological well-being. If people start to realize just how much risk they truly face and how much they have themselves to blame. This reminds me of the tightrope wire health professionals have to walk, telling people how much power we all have over getting cancer. Uh, this is the off-sided paper that calculated that we may be able to prevent approximately 90% of human cancers, but by present trends, the researcher is talking about present trends of the 1960s when the paper was published. They remain true to this day, though, about a half century later. Genetic factors are not the major causes of chronic diseases. Using identical twins to see how much was really just in your genes, of all the chronic diseases they looked at, cancers had the lowest genetic component, again only about 10% attributable to bad genes. What runs in families is bad habits. But when you go out there and tell everyone the good news about how much power we have over not getting cancer, what about the people who already have it? When people are diagnosed with cancer, they often ask, why me? Did I do something wrong? Is this my fault? So you can imagine how the message of well, yeah, kinda, uh, could be destructive for patients or survivors. In other words, a message that is intended to empower people in a prevention context could just make cancer victims feel guilty. But the truth is still the truth, no matter how difficult it may be. So what we have to do is try to guide patients to switch from feelings of guilt to a responsibility approach. They have personal control. They can make different choices from then on. We need to give them a sense of agency in their life. Better, though, to try to take those steps before you get cancer. If you look at the classics, the most frequently cited articles in the scientific nutrition literature, the original glycemic index paper comes out in number 10, cited more than a thousand times, and learning about fruit, vegetables, and cancer prevention was a hallmark. But hitting the top five, cited more than 2,000 times, dietary modulation of the human microbiome, introducing the concept of prebiotics. Prebiotics are the food components that feed and nourish the good bacteria in our gut, like fiber and resistant starch. In general, eating high-fiber plant foods is a good foundation for a prebiotic-rich diet. 
Once upon a time, fiber was just thought of as just an undigested component of foods, known only for bulking up stools and keeping our bowels regular. Then we discovered an array of receptors in the body in which fiber breakdown products fit in like a lock and key. We feed our good bacteria with fiber, and they feed us right back, munching the fiber and creating short-chain fatty acids that get absorbed into our bloodstream and fit into these receptors that are expressed on immune cells and generally mediate a direct anti-inflammatory effect. So the reason for lower systemic inflammation in plant-based eaters may not just be due to the abundance of anti-inflammatory molecules in plant foods, or the avoidance of pro-inflammatory molecules in animal foods, but from the production of anti-inflammatory molecules from scratch by our good gut bugs when we feed them fiber. Just to give you an idea how protective fiber-rich foods can be, those randomized to get advice to eat fiber-rich plant foods during radiation therapy for cancer didn't just experience reduced toxicity during the treatments, but even a full year later. Indeed, the benefits of fiber are supported by more than a century of research. Prospective studies show striking reductions in death from all causes put together, including total cancer deaths, total cardiovascular disease deaths and incidents, stroke incidents, and incidents of colorectal, breast, and esophageal cancer. And dose-response relationships suggest that the more the better in terms of protecting against heart attacks and stroke, type 2 diabetes, and cancer. So at a minimum, fiber intake should be no less than 25 to 29 grams per day, with additional benefits likely to accrue with higher intakes. Yet the average American only consumes about 16 grams of fiber per day. We have co-evolved over millennia with gut bacteria to the point of reliance on our good gut bugs, a kind of symbiosis for fiber digestion and the production of short-chain fatty acids and even certain vitamins. Yet we're not holding up our end of the bargain. We're supposed to be providing up to 100 or so grams of fiber a day, and we are barely passing along a measly 16 grams. The simplest solution, the simplest approach to remedy this lack of dietary fiber is to encourage consumption of whole food, plant-based nutrition. In the year 2000, a new human hormone was discovered. It was the 21st documented fibroblast growth factor, so they called it FGF21. Since its discovery, FGF21 has emerged as a key agent for promotion of metabolic and artery health, leanness, and longevity. Injected into fat monkeys, and they lose body weight without reducing food intake. And not just a little, a 27% drop in body fat eating the same amount. In mice, it increases their lifespan 30 to 40%, comparable to lifelong caloric restriction, but again was achieved without decreasing food intake. The researchers conclude that FGF21 could potentially be used as a hormone therapy to extend lifespan in mammals, which has gotten you know, big pharma salivating, raising the question, can aging be drugged? And that's not all it can do. The idea that one drug can treat obesity, diabetes, dyslipidemia like high cholesterol, and hypertension all at once might have seemed impossible a few years ago, but is now a tantalizing and exciting prospect. The reason you can't just give people straight FGF21 is that it gets rapidly broken down in the body, so you'd have to get injections like every hour or two around the clock. So drug companies try to patent a variety of longer-acting FGF21 lookalikes, and indeed give people a little PF052310023, and they can lose about 10 pounds in 25 days, along with dramatic drops in triglycerides and cholesterol. But then the side effects of these newfangled drugs started cropping up. Okay, so hey, what about this? We package the FGF21 gene into a virus, and then inject the virus and have it like stitch extra FGF21 genes into our DNA. Or you can just lace on your running shoes. Right? Exercise boosts FGF21 levels, which may in fact be one of the reasons exercise is so good for us. Which works better, though? Aerobic exercise, eight weeks of running training, or resistance exercise, eight weeks of weights? The answer is both, but the resistance exercise edged out the running, a 42% increase in FGF21 versus a 25% increase in the aerobic exercise group. OK, but what can we do with food 
Yeah, you could try engineering and injecting it, but wouldn't it be easier to just stimulate our own endogenous natural production through diet? One way is through no diet at all. You may have noticed it's been dubbed the starvation hormone. That's because fasting induces FGF21, but not just a day or two. Physiologically, FGF21 expression is markedly increased in response to fasting, starvation, but unlike mice, which show an increase after just six hours of fasting, humans don't get a notable surge in FGF21 until after a week. Right? Fasting can quadruple FGF21, but it takes 10 days of fasting, which is you know, the very poster child of an unsustainable eating pattern. So, how can you get the benefits without the starvation? Uh, might a ketogenic diet be able to mimic the fast? Nope, keto diets don't work. In fact, keep it up for a few months, and you can actually get a significant decline in levels. High-fat diets may even interfere with the boost you get from exercise, uh, seen here in a study of high-intensity interval training. What kind of diet does work, then? We'll find out next. Over a century ago, fasting was hailed not only as a means of combating cerebral lassitude, but also for the prolongation of healthy longevity. If that turns out to be true, FGF21 might be a missing link. FGF21 is characterized as a systemic enhancer of longevity. It can be boosted through prolonged fasting, but thankfully there are other less drastic measures, such as more carbs or less protein. Uh, give people lots of starchy foods, and you can shoot up FGF21 levels. The healthiest sources would likely be whole grains and beans, since butyrate appears to boost FGF21 too, and we get that from fiber. That's one of the things our good gut bugs make from fiber-rich foods. Circulating FGF21 levels are also increased dramatically when you eat a lower protein diet, over 150% increase within four weeks. And when I say protein restriction, it can just be restricting protein intake down from the typical excess that most Americans get down to the recommended amount. The recommended daily allowance of protein for most men is 56 grams of protein a day, though most American men are getting over 100. So if you take men getting the typical excess of about 112 grams a day and reduce them down to 64, uh, which again is still more than the recommended 56, so the protein-restricted group was still getting more than enough protein, you can essentially double FGF21 levels in the blood. That may help explain why, despite them getting significantly more calories, they lost more body fat. How can you eat 300 more calories a day and still lose two more pounds of straight body fat? By just bringing your protein levels down to normal levels. Right? Who hasn't fantasized about a diet that allows ingestion of excess calories that are burned off effortlessly by ramping up fat burning? So you know, maybe we should play down protein to play up metabolism, thanks to FGF21. Even just a quite modest protein restriction regimen down to the recommended levels may have significant clinical benefits. Now, this was after a month and a half. A similar study found that even less protein restriction, uh, taking men down to just 73 grams a day, resulted in a six-fold increase in FGF21 within a single week, accompanied by a significant increase in insulin sensitivity. They conclude that dietary protein dilution uh, promotes metabolic health in humans. Evidence suggesting that a lower protein intake is positively associated with increased health, survival, and insulin sensitivity has continued to mount, but we weren't sure exactly how, but maybe FGF21 provides an explanation. Interestingly, studies were feeding people 9% calories from protein, which is about what the Okinawans were getting when they were one of the healthiest, longest living populations in the world. You may remember my videos on methionine restriction to both fight cancer and as a life extension strategy. Uh, methionine is an amino acid found predominantly in animal proteins, and so one could achieve methionine restriction by you know, cutting down on animal foods. 
Well, that may actually be an FGF21 effect. Methionine restriction boosts levels, uh, so much so it's been called the most important mediator of the metabolic reprogramming in methionine restriction. So uh, some proteins may be more important to restrict than others. The highest methionine levels are in meat. Legumes, which are you know, beans, split peas, chickpeas, and lentils, have about three times less methionine than meat. FGF21 has been proposed as a potential mediator of the protection from cancer, autoimmune diseases, obesity, and diabetes afforded by strictly plant-based diets. Maybe that's one of the reasons that whole food plant-based diets have been shown to have such extraordinary results. Yeah, take Dr. Esselstyn's work, for example, right, showing that the number one killer of men and women can be largely halted or reversed, and the risk of heart attack almost eliminated with the help of a whole food, low-fat, vegan diet. This benefit can't be attributed solely to cholesterol reduction. Since we have these new powerful cholesterol-lowering drugs now that can force cholesterol levels as low as healthy eaters, but appear to have less effect. So the market benefits reported by Esselstyn evidently reflect a variety of protective mechanisms associated with a whole food plant-based diet, and FGF21 may be one of those mechanisms. So it's not just the fat and cholesterol, but the quality and quantity of protein that may also be playing a role. But there's never been a study to see whether vegans do indeed have higher levels of FGF21 until now. I'm glad I didn't just pass on the study based on the title. In addition to studying New Zealand obese mice, they investigated the circulating FGF21 levels among those eating plant-based, and then put it to the test by removing meat from other people's diets to see if FGF21 would go up. And FGF21 levels were markedly higher in vegan humans compared to omnivores, and they went up when the omnivores were switched to vegetarian diets after just four days. And not just a little. FGF21 levels increased by 232% before and after just four days free of meat. Bottom line is that you know, the various fasting approaches are likely to have limited efficacy, particularly on aging and conditions other than obesity, unless combined with high-nourishment diets, such as the moderate calorie intake, and, uh, mostly plant-based Mediterranean, or Okinawa low-protein diets, by which they mean the recommended amount of protein. According to the largest study of risk factors for death in human history, a poor diet causes more death than anything. Cigarettes only kill about 8 million people a year, whereas humanity's diet kills millions more. What's the worst aspect of our diet? Uh, processed meat, uh, Twinkies, soda? No. The five deadliest things about our diet are inadequate fruit intake, not enough fruit, not enough whole grains, not enough vegetables, too much salt, and not enough nuts and seeds. Uh, nuts should come as no surprise, since interventional trials have shown that eating nuts improves artery function, and arterial diseases like heart disease are among our leading killers. But that's not all nuts can do. They may also improve blood sugar control, lower cholesterol, suppress inflammation, reduce oxidative stress, and feed our friendly gut flora. All nuts or just tree nuts? What about peanuts? What about peanut butter? About 50% of peanut consumption in the U.S. is through peanut butter, but the association between peanut butter and mortality has not been thoroughly evaluated. To get that granular, though, we can call on the NIH AARP study, the largest prospective health and diet study in history that followed more than a half million people since the 1990s. And nut consumption in general appeared to protect against all-cause mortality, meaning nut eaters live on average longer lives, and specifically are less likely to die from cancer, cardiovascular disease, respiratory disease, infectious causes, so maybe they help immunity as well, liver disease, and kidney disease. However, no such associations were found for peanut butter. So when it comes to living longer, peanut butter doesn't seem to count. Why? Well, we know peanut butter consumers tend to eat more meat, smoke cigarettes, and we're less likely to exercise, but the researchers controlled for all that— red meat, white meat, tobacco use, exercise, and vegetables, fruits, and whole grains. So it's not like the peanut butter eaters were just eating more white bread sandwiches or something. 
The researchers didn't control for sugar, though, so it's possible they could have been eating more sugary jelly. Uh, it could also be the processing that goes into making peanut butter, the added trans fat, oil, salt, and sugar. But regular nuts are also often eaten with added oil, sugar, and salt. Could it just be the peanuts themselves? I mean, technically they aren't nuts, so maybe they just don't have the same benefits. But no, a meta-analysis of all such studies found the same nut-like benefits for whole peanuts, just not peanut butter. Well, one thing missing from even no-salt, oil-free, sugar-free nut and seed butters is intact cellular structure. As I noted in How Not to Diet, no matter how well we chew whole or chopped nuts, some of the nutrients remain trapped in tiny particles that deliver a bounty of prebiotic goodness to our friendly flora. That makes me wonder if there would have been any difference between chunky and smooth peanut butter. In the meanwhile, there is compelling evidence to recommend the use of nuts, preferably raw nuts over salted or toasted, and whole or chopped nuts rather than nut butters at least three times a week in order to maximize our chances of living longer and healthier lives. Today you can get your DNA sequence, the letters of your entire genetic code spelled out for like a thousand bucks, a bargain compared to the hundred million or so it cost 20 years ago. And for around a hundred dollars you can get partial DNA sequencing. It's only a click away. Direct to consumer genetic testing like 23andMe for ancestry, health, love, you name it. Unfortunately, many tests currently offered have not been appropriately validated, and consequently the consumer may be paying for something that's ultimately useless or just flat out wrong. There's an increasing demand from the public for direct-to-consumer genetic tests, but when put to the test, researchers found an alarmingly high false positive rate, meaning the analysis said you had some high-risk gene, but it simply wasn't true and this happened 40% of the time. Like they said you had the Angelina Jolie BRCA breast cancer genes, but it wasn't true. And in addition to the 40% false positive rates, some variants they did identify correctly were misclassified as being high risk, when in actuality they weren't high risk at all. You can see how it's in these companies' best interest to give you scary outlier results so you'll think the money was worth it and pay for additional testing. But both false positive results and misclassification of variants can result in significant implications for an individual, including unnecessary stress and even unnecessary medical procedures. I mean, what if you got a preventive double mastectomy because you falsely thought you were at high risk when you didn't even have the BRCA mutations? Yes, these genome-wide association studies have now successfully identified thousands of common genetic variants that influence the risk of complex diseases, as I've talked about in my video on personalized nutrition. But nevertheless, the discovered gene variants do not markedly expand our predictive ability compared with what can be achieved by using only information from long-known traditional risk factors. Take uh, type 2 diabetes, for example. We've identified about 50 genes that are linked to increased diabetes risk. But even if you put them all together, obese persons with the lowest genetic risk for diabetes we're nearly five times more likely to develop disease than normal weight persons with the highest genetic risk. In other words, this would send out the wrong message to someone who is obese, giving them a false sense of security. Knowledge about type 2 diabetes genetic susceptibility, based on what we know so far, has no implications for decisions about who should be targeted for intensive lifestyle interventions. Everyone with excessive body fat, regardless of genetics, needs to slim down to reduce the risk of diabetes. What about this famous study that purported to show that personally tailored dietary interventions could improve blood sugar responses, to the extent that some commentators said it raised questions about the usefulness of universal dietary recommendations, period. But if you actually read the study, it turns out their results do not demonstrate high interpersonal variation in relative blood sugar responses, do not show that their model is superior to current methods of detecting high blood sugars, and do not show that personalized nutrition advice is superior to standard dietary advice to manage high blood sugar responses after meals. But hey, what about personalized genetic risk counseling just to at least motivate diabetes prevention? In a somewhat forlorn bid to regain credibility, knowledge 
of individual genetic risk profiles has been touted as effective in motivating people to commit more strenuously to relevant disease prevention efforts. Here again, however, available evidence does not support the claims. And indeed, it did not seem to help those at risk for diabetes. Randomized people to get genetic tests worth hundreds or thousands of dollars profiling their subtle differences in risk for up to 40 different diseases. In this case, it was Navigenics, who described their goal as empowering people with personal genetic insights to help motivate them to improve their health. Yet, it didn't work. No measurable changes in diet and lifestyle, e even in the short term. Randomize people to personalized nutrition insights, like determining who might genetically benefit particularly well from eating more greens or, or eating to lower their cholesterol, yet there was no significant changes in diet at month 6 compared to those who didn't get that personalized info, or even in month 3. So it's no surprise there weren't any differences in weight or belly fat, cholesterol, or, or any of the other biomarkers. Put all the studies together, and what do we find? No significant benefits for telling smokers who's at particular risk for lung cancer, for instance, or who needs to eat particularly healthy or move especially more. Bottom line is that expectations that communicating DNA-based risk estimates changes behavior is not supported by existing evidence. Yet that was the stated reason for the big presidential push for precision medicine, to empower individuals to take a more active role in their own health. It's no surprise that the theme of personal empowerment is invoked. It's great for marketing, but it's not particularly empowering. In fact, if anything, it leaves patients even more reliant on authority, and it's not even very personal, since the genetic contributions we know of are so small compared to how we actually live our lives. Uh, why, then, is patient empowerment emphasized as its cardinal virtue? because it exploits the appeal to generate political and public support for an increasingly industrialized medical-industrial scientific complex which moves literally trillions of dollars around the globe. This isn't some grand conspiracy theory. It's just the way the system works. Healthy living directly threatens many powerful corporations. I mean, eat less sugar, eat less meat and healthier populations do nothing but lower the demand for doctors and drugs. Seemingly willfully blind to this evidence, the United States continues to overwhelmingly spend its health dollars on clinical care, cleaning up our lifestyle-induced messes. Uh, so it's not surprising that we far outspend other countries, while at the same time have worse outcomes. While major new taxpayer gifts were being promised to high-tech medicine, the United States had already sunk to the bottom of the list of comparable countries in terms of disease experience and life expectancy. Overrated precision medicine promises may be serving vested interests, justifying the exorbitant health care expenditures in our finance-based medicine. But in many ways, the American healthcare system is the most advanced in the world, yet all our whiz-bang technology cannot fix what ails us. Let's start with the basics. Eat your broccoli, take the stairs, and don't worry about whether you have a 5.6% or 7.7% lifetime risk for grave disease, because either way, a sensible lifestyle is the healthiest choice. It is perhaps rare in the history of nations that one finds good reasons to render homage to the generosity and altruism of governments and those in power, but the birth of the International Agency for Research on Cancer presents one of those rare occasions. It all started with a single letter from a bereaved husband relating the suffering of his wife after a cancer diagnosis, cascading into this open letter calling for governments to devote half of 1% of their military budgets to fight for life by attacking one of the greatest plagues that weigh on humanity, and 18 months later, the IARC was born in the World Health Organization with what overarching motive? Cancer prevention. The IARC is best known for its monographs, book-sized reports evaluating whether or not some suspected carcinogen does in fact cause cancer. They're generally accepted as close to a final word as there is on whether or not something is carcinogenic. And their 114th monograph, published in 2018, was on meat.
After thoroughly reviewing the accumulated scientific literature, a working group of 22 experts from 10 countries, after considering more than 800 different studies, concluded their 500-page report by establishing that something like a burger or pork chop is probably carcinogenic, probably causes cancer, but processed meat was placed as a group 1 carcinogen, which is the highest level of certainty, meaning that, according to the best available evidence, the consumption of processed meat causes cancer. So that means foods like bacon cause cancer. Ham, hot dogs, breakfast links, lunch meat cause cancer. But their definition also includes, for example, turkey deli slices. Specifically, eating processed meat causes colorectal cancer, cancers of the colon or rectum, the second most deadly cancer worldwide after lung cancer, which is caused largely from smoking. Colorectal cancer is the second leading cause of cancer death here in the United States as well, and it doesn't just strike older people. It's also a leading cause of cancer and death from cancer earlier in life as well. The meat industry wasn't happy, calling it dramatic and alarmist overreach. Speaking of dramatic and alarmist overreach, one ag group in Italy sent out a press release, just say no to terrorism on meat. The gloves were off. The meat industry in Canada tried to pressure the government to cut off funds to the IARC, asking the health minister to pull all funding from the agency after they dared to question meat. And the U.S. meat industry did the same thing. It's no surprise the IARC is under siege by corporate interests trying to challenge their cancer evaluations on uh, Monsanto's Roundup pesticide and meat, trying to discredit the agency and undermine financial support. Internal documents have revealed that Monsanto scientists, for example, casually discussed ghostwriting scientific articles and suppressing any science that conflicts with the company's assertions of safety. The chemical industry has joined the corporate cacophony, calling the IARC monographs dubious and misleading. These are classic strategies straight out of the tobacco industry playbook. But there's little to suggest that as a corporate actor, big tobacco differs fundamentally from big booze or, or big food, for example. One recurring corporate talking point is that basically the IARC never met a carcinogen it didn't like but the vast majority end up being characterized as just possibly carcinogenic, or there really aren't sufficient data to make a determination either way. And look, they only spend time looking at substances for which there's already an existing body of scientific literature indicating a degree of carcinogenic hazard to humans, so I mean, no wonder many of them end up indeed carcinogenic. How did the IARC respond to all the criticism? The World Health Organization received a number of queries, expressions of concern, and requests for clarification following the publication of their Meat and Cancer Report. They replied, hey, uh, we never told anyone to stop eating processed meats. Look, your body, your choice. They just indicated that reducing consumption of these products can reduce the risk of a leading cancer killer. So, hey, you like cancer? You do you. The IARC is just a research organization that evaluates the evidence on the causes of cancer. After that, what you do with that information is up to you. The American Cancer Society was nice and clear when it came to alcohol. When it comes to cancer, it's best not to drink. But they got a little more wishy-washy with processed meat, suggesting people can get away with just limiting their intake. The European Commission was a little clearer. To reduce our risk of cancer, we should eat plenty of whole grains, pulses, which are beans, split peas, chickpeas, lentils, uh, vegetables, and fruits, limit sugary, fatty, salty foods, and straight up avoid soda, sausage, and other processed meats. After all, in answering the question, how much meat is safe to eat, the IARC replied that we don't yet know whether a safe level exists, period. In 2018, Arguably the most prestigious cancer research institution in the world, the International Agency for Research on Cancer, the World Health Organization, published a report on processed meat, concluding that foods like bacon, ham, hot dogs, lunch meat, and sausages are cancer-causing, classifying processed meat as a Group 1 carcinogen. These findings, conclude the director of the agency, further support current public health recommendations to limit the intake of meat. Critics question putting processed meat in the same carcinogenic classification as asbestos or, or tobacco, or as a pesticide company roughly put it, how can eating processed meat fall into the same category as mustard gas? 
the classification only relate to the strength of evidence that the agent causes cancer or not, not how much cancer. I mean, this does not mean they're all equally dangerous. I mean, it's safer to eat a sandwich filled with pastrami than plutonium, even though they're both group 1 carcinogens, both substances known to cause cancer in people. OK, so just how dangerous is meat? The relative risk of colorectal cancer was 18% for every 50 grams a day. Okay. Uh, so what exactly does that mean? Well, the 50 grams is about one hot dog, or two breakfast links, or two slices of Canadian bacon or ham. So a daily sandwich with one or two slices of bologna would increase your colorectal cancer risk by 18%. But a half-pound pastrami on rye would bump it up more like 80%. OK, but what does the 18% increased risk really mean? Uh, one way to look at it is absolute risk versus relative risk. Uh, assuming that the lifetime risk of colorectal cancer is about 5%, like 1 in 20, increasing your risk about 20% would only bump up your absolute risk of getting colorectal cancer from 5% to 6%. Now, on a population scale, an 18% drop in risk could mean about 25,000 fewer cases of colorectal cancer every year in the United States, 25,000 fewer families a year dealing with that diagnosis. If we swapped out the daily bologna sandwich for hummus or chose veggie dogs instead. So it all depends how you look at it. Colorectal cancer is our second leading cause of cancer death for men and women combined after lung cancer. So if you don't smoke, colon and rectal cancer may be your greatest cancer nemesis but we can drop the risk of getting it by about a fifth with a single dietary tweak, cutting a serving of processed meat out of our daily diet. How does 18% increase cancer risk compared to other risky behavior? In my testimony before the Dietary Guidelines Scientific Committee, I made what may sound like a hyperbolic metaphor. I mean, we try not to smoke around our kids. Why would we send them to school with a bologna sandwich? But that's not hyperbole. According to the Surgeon General, living with a smoker increases your risk of lung cancer by 15%. So breathing secondhand smoke day in and day out increases your risk of lung cancer almost as much as eating a serving of processed meat day in and day out increases your risk of colorectal cancer. The meat industry responded by saying that the risks and benefits must be considered together before telling people what to eat or breathe. I mean, think about all the baloney benefits. Lunch meat isn't just about cancer, but convenience. Indeed, processed meat isn't just about cancer. An article railing against the World Health Organization's meat terrorism cited the global burden of disease studies comparing how many cancer deaths are caused by processed meat consumption compared to tobacco or alcohol use. But if you look at the study they're referencing, the 30-something thousand deaths attributable to higher processed meat intake are just the colorectal cancer deaths, and don't also include the 100,000 deaths from diabetes or the 400,000 deaths from heart disease. So in actuality, we may be talking a half million deaths attributable to processed meat. And it's not just colon and rectal cancer. If you look at the science since the IARC decision was published, processed meat may also increase the risk of prostate cancer, breast cancer, and pancreatic cancer. Unfortunately, despite growing public health concerns about processed meat consumption, there have been no changes in the amount of processed meat consumed by U.S. adults over the last 18 years. Of course, it would have helped if the last Dietary Guidelines for Americans had happened to mention that processed meat was a carcinogen. An explicit and science-based statement on processed meat in the next Dietary Guidelines would certainly help, but the scientific committee made no such recommendation. Sadly, even those diagnosed with colorectal cancer hardly improved their overall lifestyle after diagnosis, uh, though that may be because 70% of cancer patients had never received nutrition advice from their medical providers during or after treatment. I mean, that just blows me away. Despite the continued obfuscation of the issue by the meat industry, they learned well from the tobacco merchants. Meat should continue to be a focus of public health action. New York City is leading the way, passing legislation to ban processed meats from school meals. What a concept, not giving our kids carcinogens. Meanwhile, 
The processed meat industry is trying to reformulate its products, kind of like in the pharmaceutical area, where you try to mitigate the potential adverse effects of one drug by prescribing an additional drug. Like you could add fiber to hot dogs or something to try to counterbalance the risk, potentially reducing the cancer load by changing how it's processed, rather than by banning processed meat altogether. Although there's a growing list of Alzheimer's disease susceptibility genes, even if you put them all together, they account for less than half of all Alzheimer's cases. The single most compelling piece of data on the potential control we have over the disease is the fact if you have identical twins with the exact same genes, even if one gets Alzheimer's, the other usually does not. So we have to think about all the other contributing factors beyond just genetics. In my video on pesticides and cancer, I talked about this study. There's a list of chlorinated pesticides, including DDE, uh, metabolite of DDT, that are classified by the EPA as probable human carcinogens. But in the study, blood levels of DDE and others were associated not with increased cancer mortality, but increased risk of other cause mortality. This led researchers to speculate it may be due to an associated increased risk of diabetes or dementia, I've talked previously about the diabetes link. What about dementia? Elevated serum pesticide levels and risk for Alzheimer's disease. A research team at Rutgers found significantly higher blood levels of DDE in Alzheimer's disease patients compared to controls, and autopsy studies show blood levels are a good proxy for brain levels. Those with the highest levels were at about four times the odds of being demented with Alzheimer's. And in a petri dish, DDE increases amyloid precursor protein levels in human brain cells, providing a potential mechanism. Here are the levels of the sticky protein implicated in the development of Alzheimer's disease before and after some DDE is added, at the levels one finds circulating in highly exposed individuals in the general population. Put all these studies together, and there does indeed seem to be a link consistent with data showing about a doubling of risk for developing dementia among those acutely pesticide poisoned. Among U.S. elders, DDT and its breakdown product DDE are also associated with increased risk of cognitive decline in general. DDT was extensively used in the United States from the 1940s to the 60s. At its peak, we were churning out 180 million pounds a year, and it's still in our bodies to this day, contaminating the bloodstreams of more than 90% of Americans, and DDE, the pesticide linked to quadrupling the odds of Alzheimer's, were at the highest levels. It's still in our bodies because it's still in the food supply. In my last video on the topic, I noted that the levels of DDT, DDE, and other banned pesticides and pollutants were much lower in the breast milk from a vegetarian mother compared to breast milk of her non-vegetarian sister, and the largest difference was noted for DDE, which was four times lower in the vegetarian sister. This is what you see across the board for these kinds of pollutants. Food samples were collected from supermarkets across the U.S. Here's what they found for dioxins and PCBs in beef, chicken, pork, processed meat, eggs, fish, all plant foods put together, and dairy products. These toxins build up the food chain, so it makes sense that the most contaminated foods are meat, fish, and dairy products, five to ten times higher levels in meat, eggs, fish, and dairy than what we find in plant foods. And unfortunately, cooking doesn't destroy pollutants like DDE. In fact, it may make them even more concentrated. And this is for a pesticide that may increase the risk of Alzheimer's disease as much as if you carried the so-called Alzheimer's gene, ApoE4. Although we're spending billions of dollars on fancy new types of chemotherapy, the overflowing sink that is cancer treatment is expected to rise by about 70% over the next two decades, because drugs are being used to merely mop up the mess rather than turn off the faucet. You can't really give drugs to people to prevent cancer because of the side effects and costs, but there is said to be overwhelming evidence that the dietary bioactive compounds found in whole plant-based foods have significant anti-cancer and cancer-preventive properties. In a previous video, I talked about the impact of diet and nutrition on the 10 hallmarks of cancer. The bottom line is that evidence points to a diet with minimal animal products, and perhaps more importantly, maximal plant foods. Some foods that appear to be particularly beneficial include fruit, especially berries, a variety of vegetables, especially greens, legumes, which are beans, split peas, chickpeas, and lentils, nuts and seeds, especially flax seeds, mushrooms, onions, garlic, herbs and spices, for example, turmeric, and as a beverage, green tea. 
Chemotherapy may not even be particularly good at mopping up the mess. Cancer drugs often impair quality of life and fail to extend patient survival. Uh, uh, let me say that again. You're paying for drugs, maybe selling your house to pay for drugs, that may just be making your life worse for no benefit. Some have suggested we demand at least three months of extended life from pharmaceuticals, but if we demand that chemo actually works, might they give up altogether? On the other hand, maybe by mandating clinically important benefits— what a concept— maybe Big Pharma would reallocate resources towards targeting the more critical cancer processes, like metastatic spread, because it's the tumor metastasis that accounts for 90% of cancer-related deaths. Who cares if some drug shrinks your primary tumor if it's spreading and cutting your life just as short? What about controlling metastatic cancer with some of those natural bioactive compounds in plants? Evidently, it's been proven that plant phytochemicals are able to inhibit nearly every step of the invasion through metastasis cascade, at least in vitro, in a petri dish. Here's a list of some purported dietary sources of anti-metastatic phytochemicals, all shown to block all sorts of cancer signaling pathways, but let me focus on one, matrix metalloproteinases. Since about 90% of cancer disability and death is due to cancer spreading uh, metastasis, let's talk about these MMPs, which actively participate in the whole metastatic journey. Matrix metalloproteinases are enzymes that allow the cancer to tunnel through the surrounding flesh and invade the lymph or blood vessels, and then enable to burrow in and grow somewhere else. So Big Pharma developed matrix metalloproteinase inhibitor drugs, which worked great in animal models, but caused severe side effects when they tried them on humans. So what about using food? There are special proteins in legumes that reduce MMP activity. What else might you expect from a Dr. Lima? Uh, but which is the leading legume? Researchers tested eight different kinds— lupin beans, chickpeas, split peas, black-eyed peas, lentils, and more common beans like kidney black or pinto, fava beans, and soybeans. Which do you think worked best? Without any beans, the matrix metalloproteinase activity churned away at around 100%, and dripping on some protein from pea soup-type peas didn't seem to help much. But the black-eyed peas, lentils, common beans, and fava beans cut enzyme activity by more than 50%. Guess what slashed activity by more than 90%? Lupin beans, chickpeas, and soybeans. Yeah, but does this translate into slowing down the cancer's spread? Researchers plated a layer of human colon cancer cells in a petri dish, and then took a razor blade to clear a strip down the middle. Within 48 hours, the cancer quickly converged to fill the gap. But when a little protein from lupin beans, chickpeas, or soybeans was dripped on, it looked like the cancer cells struggled to close the distance. OK, but they used raw beans. You don't know if these anti-cancer proteins are destroyed by cooking until you put it to the test, and the matrix metalloproteinase inhibitors in soybeans, at least, remain active after cooking. So maybe it's no wonder that dietary legume consumption reduces risk of colorectal cancer. Yeah, but colon cancer, which sprouts from the inner lining of the colon, could potentially come in contact with some of these bean proteins. Presumably they wouldn't get into the bloodstream. Those eating vegetarian do seem to have significantly lower levels of matrix metalloproteinases, but this is just thought to be due to their lower levels of inflammation, similar to the way non-smokers also have lower MMP levels. This is good, because this enzyme isn't just a cancer biomarker, but also may be involved in autoimmune diseases and cardiovascular disease. The machete-type nature of this enzyme can hack through the inflamed, cholesterol-filled atherosclerotic lesions lining diseased arteries and cause the plaque to rupture. People know that those eating more plant-based tend to have less heart disease, but may not realize they harbor significantly less cancer risk too, particularly among those eating strictly plant-based diets. In 2017, and to much fanfare, menu labeling for calorie counts began to be mandated in national chain restaurants. I mean, shouldn't consumers have the knowledge needed to make healthy eating choices outside the home? It just makes sense that caloric information on menus will help consumers limit food intakes to stay within daily energy needs. But it didn't work. Turns out calorie labels aren't 
not effective, perhaps shaving on average an insignificant 8 calories off a meal. You could have totally predicted that. Why? Just as one might divine the value of front-of-back traffic light labeling from the ferocity of the food industry response against it, one could probably gauge the futility of calorie labeling by the ease at which some regulations have been passed. McDonald's voluntarily started publishing calorie info nationally back in 2012, after a labeling mandate in New York City was found to have no overall effect on consumer behavior. So studies suggest such labeling could boost perceptions of the restaurant's concern for consumers' well-being, while carefully not undermining any Big Mac attacks. At the same time, McDonald's announced plans for adding seasonal produce to their menu. How cynical do you have to be not to at least recognize that as a good thing? Ironically, adding a healthy option can actually drive people to make even worse choices. <laughs> Ready to have your mind blown? If you offer people a choice of side dishes, something unhealthy like french fries, or something more neutral like a baked potato, only about 10% of individuals with high self-control will splurge for the fries. Good for them. French fries are so unhealthy, though, that as a public health do-gooder, you add a third option, an even healthier option than the baked potato, a side salad, to appeal to their better natures. So then, instead of choosing between an indulgent choice and the more neutral baked potato, they have their pick of the indulgent choice, the neutral choice, or an even healthier choice. Even if everyone doesn't choose the salad, more will go for the middle ground baked potato over the fries, right? So how much farther does French fry fancying fall by adding the salad option to the mix? It shoots up, tripling to 33%. Uh, without the salad option, only 1 in 10 chose the fries, but that jumped to a third of people just at the sight of salad. The same thing happens when you offer people the choice between a bacon cheeseburger, a chicken sandwich, or a veggie burger. In a no-healthy-option scenario, where people were offered the cheeseburger, a chicken sandwich, or a fish sandwich, 17% chose the burger. Swap out the fish sandwich for a veggie burger, and bacon cheeseburger preference doubled to 37%. How can just seeing a healthy option push people to make unhealthier choices? The paper describing these series of experiments was entitled Vicarious Goal Fulfillment, when the mere presence of a healthy option leads to an ironically indulgent decision. The thought is that seeing the salad or veggie burger, people make the mental note to choose that at eh, some nebulous next time, thereby giving them the excuse to indulge now. See, there's a fascinating glitch of human psychology called self-licensing. This is when we unwittingly justify doing something that draws us away from our goals after we've just done something that brings us towards them, like uh, justifying eating a donut because you lost so much weight last week. We reward ourselves with an indulgence that sets us back. If you give smokers quote-unquote vitamin C supplements, they subsequently smoke more cigarettes than if you give smokers what you explain are placebo pills, even though both groups were given identical sugar pills. The group who thought they were taking supplements smoked nearly twice as much, perhaps thinking at some subconscious level that since they had just done something good for the health, they could afford to live a little, which may have in effect indeed occasioned them to live a little less. You can see how this could translate into our lifestyle arenas. Those given placebo pills they believe to be dietary supplements not only express less desire to subsequently engage in exercise, but followed through by walking about a third less. Compared to those who were told the pills were placebos, misled participants were also more likely to choose a buffet over what was described as a healthy organic meal. Would they eat more, too? A seminal study entitled The Liberating Effect of Weight Loss Supplements on Dietary Control put it to the test. Participants were randomized to take a known placebo or a purported weight loss supplement, actually just the same placebo, and later covertly observed at a buffet. Not only did the supplement subjects eat more food, they chose less healthy items. They also ate about 30% more candy in a bogus taste test, and ordered more sugary drinks. Hence, the investigators concluded, People who rely on dietary supplements for health protection may pay a hidden price, the curse of licensed self-indulgence. 
So, uh, circling back, what the vicarious goal fulfillment studies added is that not only does making progress towards a goal rationalize decision-making that undermines us, but even just considering making progress can have a similar licensing effect. Note the study subjects were not only moved to make the unhealthy-er choice, but the unhealthiest choice. You'd think that even if people didn't go for the salad or veggie option, the presence of a healthier alternative might have at least encouraged them to choose something in between. Not as healthy, but not the unhealthiest, but instead it moved people in the opposite direction. Compared to the no-healthy option of chocolate-covered Oreos, regular Oreos, or golden Oreos, adding a lower-calorie Oreo option doubled the likelihood that the study participants would go straight for the most indulgent chocolate-covered option. This is attributed to another illogical quirk of human psychology indelicately named the what-the-hell effect. Uh, this is when one forbidden cookie can lead dieters to eat the whole bag. Like once you've already strayed from your goals, well then hey, why not go all the way? So once people decide they're going to get that salad next time and spoil themselves just as once, they might as well go for the most indulgent choice. The halo of healthy foods can even warp our perceptions. Show weight conscious people a burger and nothing else, then ask them to estimate the number of calories, and the average answer is 734 calories. Now show folks the exact same burger accompanied by three celery sticks, and they guess the total comes out to 619 calories. Did they think the celery had negative calories? No, most knew the celery had calories too, but just the juxtaposition of the burger with the celery made the burger seem healthier. The same thing happens when you add an apple to a bacon and cheese waffle sandwich, a side salad to beef chili, or some carrots next to a cheese steak. About 100 calories appear to disappear. Health halo effects may explain why people are more likely to order dessert and more sugary drinks with a quote-unquote healthier sub at Subway versus a Big Mac at McDonald's, even though the sub used in the study, filled with ham, salami, and pepperoni, had 50% more calories to begin with. Even just a reference to healthy foods can do it. Show people a picture of a Big Mac, and people estimate it has 646 calories. OK, then just add the words, for your health, eat at least five fruits and vegetables per day. And all of a sudden, the same burger in the same ad was thought to have only 503 calories. Merely offering or even promoting salads and fruit can bring McDonald's accolades and bolster consumer loyalty without, ironically, helping their health. There are three broad approaches to mediating the ruin of risky choices. Inform people, like using labeling. Nudge people, for example by offering financial incentives. Or directly intervene to make the activity less harmful. Uh, which do you think prevented more car fatalities? Mandating driver education, labeling cars about crash risk, or removing the human element altogether by just making sure airbags are installed? There are public education nutrition campaigns, from sugar pack ads on public transit informing consumers how much sugar is in soft drinks, to hot dogs cause butt cancer billboards educating about the link between processed meat and colorectal cancer. But is there a way to make products nutritionally safer in the first place? The ban on trans fats offers a useful lesson. In 1993, the Harvard Nurses Study found that high intake of trans fat may increase the risk of heart disease by 50%. Uh, that's where the trans fat story started in Denmark, and it ended a decade later with a ban on added trans fats there in 2003. It took another 10 years, though, before the U.S. even started considering a ban. All the while, trans fats were killing estimated tens of thousands of Americans every year, resulting in as many years of healthy life lost as conditions like meningitis, cervical cancer, and multiple sclerosis. If so many people were suffering and dying, why did it take so long for the U.S. to even suggest taking action? One can look at the fight over New York City's trans fat ban for a microcosm of the national debate. Opposition came down hard from the food industry complaining about government intrusion, likening the city to a nanny state. Since trans fats can be found naturally in meat and dairy, the livestock industry echoed the Institute of Shortening's everything in moderation argument. Critics styled such proposals as the rise of food fascism. But it was the restaurant and food industries that limited consumer choice by so broadly fouling the food supply with these dangerous fats. 
If food zealots get their wish and banning added trans fats, another argument went, what's next? Vested corporate interests tend to rally around these kinds of slippery slope arguments to try to distract from the very real fact that people are dying. I mean, what if the government tries to make us eat broccoli? This actually came up in a Supreme Court case over Obamacare. Chief Justice Roberts suggested Congress could start ordering everyone to buy vegetables, a fear Justice Ginsburg dubbed the broccoli horrible. Technically, Congress could compel the American public to eat more plant-based, Justice Ginsburg wrote, yet one can't offer the hypothetical and unreal possibility of a vegetarian state as a credible argument. As one legal scholar put it, judges and lawyers live on the slippery slope of analogies. They're not supposed to ski it to the bottom. New York City finally won its trans fat fight, preserving its status as a public health leader. For example, New York banned lead paint 18 years before federal action was taken, despite decades of unequivocal evidence of its harm. Comparing stroke and heart attack rates before and after the rollout of the trans fat ban in different New York counties, researchers estimated successfully reduced cardiovascular death rates by about 5%. This then became the model for the nationwide ban years later. How was the public health community able to triumph when attempts in the past to regulate the food industry failed? If you would have asked me about the odds of a national trans fat ban, I would have said, fat chance. In Denmark, as a leading Danish cardiologist put it, instead of warning consumers about trans fats and telling them what they are, we've simply removed them. But we're Americans. As they say here, you can put poison in the food if you label it properly. If people know the risk, the argument goes, then they should be able to eat whatever they want. But that's assuming they've been given all the facts, which isn't always the case, given the food industry's model of systemic dishonesty. As one health ethics professor put it, given the predilection for predatory deception and manipulation, government intervention was deemed necessary. But how are you going to get it passed? First, there was a labeling requirement. Manufacturers had to start adding trans fat content to products' nutrition facts labeling. Uh, ostensibly, this was to influence consumers, but it may have had a bigger impact on producers. Uh, now that they had to divulge the truth, companies scrambled to reformulate their products to gain a no trans fat competitive edge. Within years of the mandatory disclosure, more than 5,000 products were introduced touting low or zero trans fats on their labels. Kentucky Fried Chicken went from being sued for having some of the highest trans fat levels to running an ad campaign where mom tells dad in front of the kids that KFC now has zero grams of trans fat, and the father yells, yeah, baby, woo, and begins eating fried chicken by the bucketful. That was the secret to passing the ban. Once the major food industry players had already reformulated their products and bragged about it, once there wasn't so much money at stake, then there was insufficient political will to block the ban, and added trans fats were taken off the playing field. In the U.S., the term junk food is often used to describe commonly known less healthy food categories, such as candy, ice cream, and chips. However, there's no consistent definition, so nutrition researchers came up with the concept of ultra-processed. The term ultra-processed food, if you want to call it that, describe industrial formulations that are typically seen in those long lists of ingredients, which, besides salt, sugar, and fat, aren't typically found in any cookbook, like the various flavors, colors, sweeteners, emulsifiers, and other additives used to imitate real foods or to disguise undesirable qualities of the final product. This roughly corresponds to my idea of red light foods in my traffic light system, and indeed most of what people eat are in the red, soda, ice cream, candy, cakes, most bread and breakfast cereals, TV dinner type, ready to heat products, chicken nuggets, fish sticks, sausages, burgers, hot dogs. There's been a dramatic rise in ultra-processed foods. In fact, the U.S. food supply is dominated by it. More than 200,000 products were assessed, and 71% were classified as ultra-processed. And of course, they aren't only in grocery stores. Sugary drinks and processed junk are ubiquitous, even at non-food retailers, providing pervasive cues to consume products that are dense in calories but poor in nutrition. As the former president of Coke put it, they want to keep Coca-Cola within an arm's reach of desire. Another major candy brand boasted, we put them everywhere, grocery stores and supermarkets, gas stations and chiropractor's offices, bowling alleys and grocery stores, which we already mentioned, not sorry. 
So this is where we are today. What is the proportion of food consumed by U.S. children and adolescents that's classified as junk? An unbelievable 56 to 70 percent of what our children and teens eat over the entire day is junk. OK, yeah, but kids will be kids. In the United States of America, more than half of the calories taken in across the board is junk. In fact, around the world, ultra-processed foods consistently account for more than 50% of the dietary caloric intake in higher-income countries. No wonder that unhealthy diets are humanity's greatest killer, the leading risk factor for death on planet Earth. Uh, what exactly are the health consequences? The biological effects of modern foods has been studied on rats, showing they gorge themselves into dramatic weight gain, inflammation, and metabolic and cognitive abnormalities. And just as ultra-processed foods were taken over, a new eating disorder was recognized, binge eating, which grew into the most common form of eating disorder. And not surprisingly, binge foods were found to be 100% ultra-processed. I, mean, I say no surprise, because these foods are engineered, so you can't have just one. Right? Uh, people don't tend to binge on broccoli. About 9 out of 10 studies found that ultra-processed food consumption was associated with adverse health outcomes, and not just obesity, but cancer, type 2 diabetes, cardiovascular diseases, irritable bowel syndrome, depression, frailty, all-cause mortality, meaning living a shorter life. Studies on youth add asthma to the list, as well as higher DNA damage. Not a single study reported an association between ultra-processed foods and beneficial health outcomes. In contrast, populations with low meat consumption and higher fiber and minimally processed food intake have far less chronic diseases, enjoy lower obesity rates, and live longer disease-free. But most findings were derived from observational studies. You don't know for sure if ultra-processed foods themselves are to blame until you put it to the test. There's never been a randomized controlled trial on ultra-processed food until now, 20 people were essentially locked in a hospital ward and received both ultra-processed and unprocessed diets for 14 days each. And here's the kicker. Diets were matched for presented calories, sugar, fat, fiber, and macronutrients. Um, see, in response to criticism, manufacturers are now proposing reformulating their products, keeping them ultra-processed, but just tweaking them by adding some fiber, for instance, or, or reducing the sugar, fat, or salt. So that's why the researchers wanted to give the study subjects the same amount of calories, sugar, fat, fiber, carbs, and protein in each of the two diets in order to try to tease out the effect of ultra-processing. So, for instance, instead of giving people Cheerios and a muffin for breakfast in the ultra-processed weeks, or a cheese and egg McMuffin with turkey, bacon, and OJ, they give people oatmeal with blueberries and almonds. Uh, both meals had the same amount of overall sugar and fat, but the unprocessed option was presented more in whole food form. For lunch, the ultra-processed group might get a turkey sandwich with non-fat Greek yogurt, canned peaches, baked potato chips, and a sugar-free crystal light lemonade, versus a Southwest entree salad with black beans, avocados, and nuts, and grapes and apples on the unprocessed diet. The same amount of calories offered, with the instruction to eat as much or as little as they wanted. So what happened? On the ultra-processed diet, they ate about 500 more calories a day. So no surprise, they gained about 2 pounds on the processed diet, or actively lost 2 pounds on the less processed diet. So it wasn't just the unbalanced nutrient profile of ultra-processed foods, so simply tweaking them wouldn't magically make them healthy. But that's what the industry would rather do. Reformulation is referred to as an unobtrusive strategy, creating the prospect of nutritional improvement without dietary change. What this study showed, however, is it may be better to limit the consumption of ultra-processed foods altogether. Why does industry love them so much? Uh, they're made with dirt-cheap ingredients, like taxpayer-subsidized corn syrup, allowing for huge corporate profit margins. But at what cost? The food industry takes in more than a trillion dollars, yet most of our health care dollars go to treat chronic disease exacerbated by these very same foods, like diabetes and heart disease. So you could argue we lose triple what the food industry pockets. The industry argues that in modern societies it's unrealistic to advise people to avoid ultra-processed foods, given societal time constraints and the difficulties of food prep. But this may just be acquiescing to the same propaganda and disinformation campaign that the processed food industry has used to co-opt families for decades. Those who think healthy foods can't be convenient have never met an apple. 
That was a response to Dr. Lustig's essay on processed food as a failed experiment. I don't like his mother blaming, but I do appreciate his prescription. Uh, there's only one recourse, real food. We need to start thinking outside of the box. In my last poop video, I talked about the potential efficacy of prunes and dried figs in helping to keep us regular. What about the influence of body position on defecation? While squatting continues to be the traditional position in populations of Asia and Africa, Westerners have become accustomed to sitting on toilet seats. And when we do that, when we sit upright, our poop is forced to make a nearly 90-degree turn, the so-called recto-anal angle. And now, that's a good thing in terms of keeping us from pooping our pants every time we sit down, but when it comes to doing our business, the sitting toilet posture defeats the purpose of our body's brilliant design, like trying to drive a car without releasing the parking brake. Yet many physicians are hesitant to discuss such an unmentionable bodily function, or may just be ignorant. Doctors don't know squat. Uh, of course, this is coming from someone who owns a company selling people squatting platforms for their toilets. In a previous video, I talked about those little footstools you can use to raise your knees when you assume the pooping position, but they were not found to make a difference in terms of self-described difficulty in defecating, or the average time spent emptying one's bowels, but those stools gave just a measly 4-inch boost. The so-called squatty potty is twice that height, and while you have to admire their graphics from booty blockage to fecal fiesta, complete with little rainbow poops, it had never been put to the test until now. The implementation of a defecation posture modification device, i.e. squatty potty, and it worked. Increased feelings of bowel emptiness reduced stranding at about a minute off of their on-the-pot reading time. The only downside is that discomfort. Even just a 6-inch riser was found to cause such extreme discomfort in research subjects in a previous trial they'd abandoned even trying to study it. How else could we get that same change in angle you get from raising your feet? How about just tipping forward? Uh, look familiar? It's like that uh, famous sculpture by Rodin, The Thinker. And indeed, Cleveland Clinic researchers set out to study the thinker position for defecation, and was able to show an opening of the anal rectal angle as measured using synodefecography, your SAT word for the day, meaning basically x-ray poop movie, opening to more than 130 degrees, better than what you get just raising your feet, which is only around 90 degrees. So the thinker position may be a more efficient method for defecation. It may help with constipation, but it has not yet been formally put to the test. As an aside, you can imagine how the worst position might be flat on your back using a bedpan. Because of the spike in blood pressure in your heart and brain when you bear down, straining at stool is associated with sudden death from heart attack and stroke. In fact, it's been found to be the most common activity of daily living being performed at the time of death in Japan. And those who can't get out of bed would seem to be especially at risk. That's why, if at all possible, it can help to sit people up in bed to cause less strain on the system. It's important to take a step back, though, in this sitting versus squatting debate, as this commentary did nearly 50 years ago. Yes, the squatting position is said to be natural, since it's used by so-called primitive peoples who pass large stools easily, such as squatting advocates blame the porcelain throne and all manner of Western maladies. But does the position really make a difference if you're eating the right foods? The man who squats because he has no modern plumbing also tends to eat more natural foods that haven't had the fiber processed out. Adding fiber to the diet can enable constipated patients to poop effortlessly without having to squat over some hole in the ground. So maybe if we just change the design of our diets, we don't have to change the design of our plumbing. We are only as old as our arteries. What can we do to preserve artery function as we age? A poor diet and sedentary behavior can lead to adverse aging processes, like impairment of the little power plants in our cells, which can result in free radical formation, oxidative stress, and inflammation, which leads to artery dysfunction that can end in the cardiovascular disease that ends us. In a series of videos I did about a decade ago, 
I discussed this landmark research showing that a single high-fat meal could cripple artery function within hours of consumption compared to no change in the low-fat meal. The high-fat meal that so crippled artery function included uh, sausage and egg McMuffins from McDonald's. How do we know the sausage, egg, or cheese was to blame? What about the crappy carbs in the biscuits? We know because the low-fat meal that didn't impair artery function was a sugary mess of carby frosted flakes. And just when your artery function finally starts to recover five or six hours later, lunchtime, when your arteries may get whacked with another load of meat, eggs, dairy, or oil. Why does it matter so much what happens after a meal within your body? Because most of us spend about 16 hours a day in that after-a-meal state, constantly hammering our arteries. No wonder cardiovascular disease is our number one killer. That doesn't just inflame the arteries in our heart, but our lungs as well. A high-fat challenge increases airway inflammation and impairs bronchodilator recovery in asthma. Have asthmatics cough up sputum from their lungs four hours after the same kind of high-fat meal, and inflammatory cells shoot up in the high-fat meal group in terms of lung function, give them two hits of their inhalers, containing a drug called albuterol or ventolin, and their airways open up, as they should, after the low-fat meal. But after the high-fat meal, the same inhaler doses don't work as well, crapping out after a few hours because of all the extra inflammation in their lungs. What you eat can determine how well you breathe. OK, but that was asthmatics. But even in non-asthmatic subjects, you get the same spike in inflammatory cells and sputum coughed out of your lungs four hours after eating what was, in this case, a Jimmy Dean's Meat Lover's Breakfast Bowl. And there aren't only more inflammatory cells. There's also a doubling of the amount of pro-inflammatory oxidized bad LDL cholesterol sucked up by the type of white blood cells that go on to form foam cells. Uh, those are the cells that build up the inflamed pus in your artery wall that leads to heart attacks. And all this happens within just hours of eating pizza, in this case. The fat in your blood goes up, and so do your endotoxin levels. Endotoxins are components of bacterial cell walls, and foods like meat can be so contaminated with bacteria, alive and dead, that they accumulate endotoxins. And we're talking about both red meat and white meat. But recent research, published in 2020, suggests the main culprit may not be endotoxins after all, but the fat itself. The saturated fat floating in your blood after an unhealthy meal may be inducing the inflammation more directly. Either way, we are accountable for what we eat meal by meal for the modification of the risk factors for chronic metabolic disease. In my last video, I discussed studies that show a single meal high in saturated fat can impair artery function in men, as measured in the arm. But what we're more concerned about is blood flow to the wall of the heart. Researchers randomized men to eat either a high-fat meal that was more than 60% fat, half of it saturated, with more than an egg's worth of cholesterol, or a low-fat meal that was mostly carbs with less than 10% fat and 50 times less cholesterol. Here's a Doppler recording of the left anterior descending coronary artery, known as the Widowmaker, before the high-fat meal. Nice strong signal squeezed down within hours after eating. This was taken five hours after the high-fat meal. The coronary flow reserve decreased after a single high-fat meal, but not after a low-fat meal with the same number of calories. What does this uh, coronary reserve mean? If part of a coronary artery is blocked for any reason, the surrounding vessels expand. That, that extra expansion capacity is called the coronary flow reserve, and it's clamped down within hours of eating a fatty meal, undermining the heart's ability to compensate for clogged arteries. That's how a high-fat meal affects blood flow to the heart. In extreme cases, you can even witness it in the back of someone's eye. This is the before. See the sluggish, milky-colored vessels? And then after a low-fat diet and drugs to help clear the fat out of the bloodstream. Can you see the difference? Their blood before looked like a milkshake. What happens if you exercise, though, right after that high-fat meal? After the meal inflammation, following the prolonged elevation of fat in the blood that occurs when you eat high-fat meals provides a likely explanation for increased cardiovascular disease, but substantial evidence has shown that acute exercise is an effective modality for clearing out some of that fat after a meal. 
However, the benefits of acute exercise for postprandial lipemia, for, for after-the-meal fatty blood, appear to be relatively short-lived. Uh, going a few days without exercise it may completely negate any benefit, no matter how fit you are. The time window appears to be between 18 hours before the meal up to around 90 minutes after the meal. And how much exercise do we need? About an hour of moderate intensity exercise should do it. In this study, though, it only took 20 minutes of stair climbing, broken up into five minutes every hour for four hours, after a McDonald's breakfast of hash browns, eggs, pancakes, muffins, sausage, and a milkshake. Following such a meal, artery function significantly decreased when the subjects just sat around after eating, but not when they did the hourly stair climbing exercises. In conclusion, hourly exercise may attenuate the negative effects not only of prolonged sitting, but also of high-fat meal intake, suggesting that stair climbing should be incorporated as an easily accessible lifestyle strategy to protect artery function. Uh, of course, it goes without saying that the other way you can protect artery function is not to eat breakfast at McDonald's in the first place. Such a meal would also have more than 2,000 mg of sodium, more than the 1,500 the American Heart Association recommends you stay under for the entire day. Give someone a meal with even less salt, a third less, and that alone can still impair artery function within an hour of consumption, even independent of the increase in blood pressure. When it comes to blood pressure, some people are salt-sensitive, meaning they suffer a large bump in blood pressure when they eat salt, but others are said to be salt-resistant. Their blood pressure doesn't really depend much on their salt intake. So for these people, is salt okay? No. High dietary sodium intake reduces artery function regardless of whether your blood pressure is salt-sensitive or salt-resistant. Your artery function is impaired either way, going from a low-salt diet to a high-salt diet. Uh, see, there's an influence of dietary salt beyond blood pressure. In spite of the seemingly unanimous consensus, some researchers, too often funded by the salt industry, claim that it's actually not good to cut down on salt. But the evidence is against these dissenters. Like the saturated fat, meat, dairy, and junk, the science indicates that sodium, not sodium reduction, is the real villain. If you compare the artery function of those who don't eat meat to those who do, the healthy ability of arteries to dilate and let more blood flow is significantly better among those eating vegetarian, and not just by a little. We're talking four times better. Well, duh. I mean, vegetarians tend to be younger, smoke less, be slimmer, and have lower rates of diabetes, high cholesterol, high blood pressure, and heart disease. But the researchers controlled for all that. They only let healthy non-smokers into the study and recruited a group of meat eaters who were just about as slim on average and about the same blood pressures, even practically the same cholesterol, a really healthy cohort of omnivores, yet they still got their arteries handed to them by the vegetarians. And the longer someone was meat-free, the better. The degree of superior artery function correlated with the number of years eating meat-free. Instead of their artery function worsening over time as they aged, it got better the longer they ate that way. This suggests that vegetarian diets by themselves have a direct beneficial effect on artery function and may help to account for the lower incidence of atherosclerosis and cardiovascular mortality. Since the researchers were able to control for other known risk factors, they figured it must be the food. But what aspect of the food? Is it simply the lack of the deleterious effect of meat? Or could it also be because the vegetarians may simply be eating more whole healthy plant foods, for example, up to a serving a day, more vegetables? When researchers compared two crappy meals, sausage and egg McMuffins, to frosted flakes, and found that the fatty meal impaired artery function within hours, but the sugary meal didn't, they blamed the fat. But it may just be the animal fat, since high-fat whole plant foods like nuts don't have the same effect. In fact, if you look at a systematic review of all the randomized controlled trials on the effect of nut consumption on artery function, you find that nuts actually make things better over time enough to counter the artery-crippling effects of a salami sandwich? Let's find out. And the answer is yes for walnuts, but no for almonds. Uh, just like there are some fruits that are better than others, like blueberries over bananas, there are some nuts that are better than others, and walnuts appear to be the blueberries of nuts. What about the blueberry of berries? Blueberries themselves, a randomized controlled crossover trial of cooked blueberries, raw blueberries, or no blueberries at all. If you feed people buns made of white flour, eggs, butter, and salt, and fill them mostly full of sugar and eggs, you get a gradual drop in artery function over the next six hours. 
but add the equivalent of a cup of wild blueberries to that same bun, and you instead get a big boost in artery function, almost as if you had just mixed the blueberries with water. But the same amount of strawberries failed to rescue artery function from the likes of two cheese blintzes with whipped cream, a sugary syrup, egg, and bacon, but that is quite the heavy load to bear. What about acai berries versus a meal with a similar amount of fat? One and a half frozen smoothie packs with half a small banana in water were able to significantly rehabilitate arterial function compared to a control smoothie with the same banana and water colored to look like the acai one, though obviously would have tasted differently. This group of researchers went all out, though, and performed a double-blind randomized control trial with raspberries measuring artery function after two hours, then 24 hours after drinking about three-quarters of a cup of frozen red raspberries blended with water, or about a cup and a half, versus a placebo drink meant to match both color and taste. The fake berry drink had no effect on artery function, but the other two did. Note the three-quarter cup dose seemed to work just as well as the cup and a half dose, which is what you see with blueberries. The benefits plateau after about a cup. The bottom line is that consumption of dietarily achievable amounts of red raspberries acutely improves artery function for up to 24 hours. You say, yeah, but by the end of the day, you're only up like 1%. Ah, but at a population level, each 1% increase is associated with a 12% reduction in risk of a cardiovascular event like a heart attack or stroke, all from just having a berry smoothie. What about berry juice? Five different concentrations of cranberry juice were used, along with a placebo control, evidently indistinguishable in color and taste. The 25% cranberry juice drink gave a little bump at two hours. The 50% juice was still working eight hours later. The 75% juice, the one that was nearly pure juice, and the ultra-concentrated juice also improved artery function within hours of consumption. But this, like that last raspberry study, just involved straight berries without some artery-crushing meal. Would berry juice be able to stop artery dysfunction caused by a high-fat meal this unhealthy, squeezing down artery function within hours? Researchers created a cocktail of grapes, lingonberry, blueberry, strawberry, and black aronia berry, and were able to turn this into this no significant change after the high-fat meal. Of course, if you had just drunk those berries alone, you'd probably get an improvement, but it's better than nothing. Well, what about something a little less exotic than black aronia berries? Uh, what about OJ? Participants were provided a high-fat meal of ham and cheese croissants, along with either a cup of water, orange juice, green tea, or red wine. The arteries didn't much like the croissants, and OJ was useless, as was the green tea and red wine. So it's probably best not to eat ham and cheese croissants in the first place. In fact, drinking orange juice with a fatty meal could actually make things worse. If you give people bacon and cheese muffins with or without orange juice, the OJ can lead to a prolongation of elevated fat in the blood as your body preferentially burns for energy all the rapidly absorbed free sugars in the juice, uh, meaning sugars not encased in cell walls, as in those in whole fruit. There is a perception that time spent asleep is time wasted, but it is widely recognized that inadequate sleep is associated with multiple acute and chronic conditions and results in an increased risk of death and disease force people to go one week with only six hours of sleep a night, you can change the expression of more than 700 genes. The most dire effect may be endothelial dysfunction. The endothelium is the thin layer of cells that covers the internal surface of blood vessels, and is responsible for allowing our arteries to relax and dilate back open properly. Randomize people for about a week to get five rather than seven hours of sleep, and just that two-hour difference a night resulted in a significant impairment in artery function. OK, but what do these numbers mean? I mean, how bad is a week of five-hour nights? Sleep deprivation is no joke. The magnitude of impairment is similar to that reported in people who smoke, have diabetes, or have coronary artery disease. No wonder people who sleep less than seven hours a night may experience a 12 to 35% increased risk of premature death compared to those who get a full seven hours. Yet a significant proportion of the population may routinely get less than that. Sufficiently long restful sleep sessions each night are said to be an indisputable cornerstone of good health. 
Okay, so what can we do about it? Those who have a sleep apnea, a common consequence of obesity that interferes with sleep, benefit from the use of a CPAP machines while they're losing the weight to treat the underlying cause, hopefully. But what if apnea isn't your problem? What if you just have trouble falling asleep or staying asleep? In my book, How Not to Diet, I have a whole section on sleep enhancement, where I go through the four rules of sleep conditioning, the four rules of sleep hygiene. Uh, what if you follow those guidelines but still can't get to sleep? Any natural dietary remedies? I already have videos on using kiwi fruit to fight insomnia and tart cherries, too. Are there any vegetables that might help? Lactuca sativa is a plant that has been traditionally used in the treatment of insomnia. What is this exotic-sounding leafy vegetable? Lettuce. Evidently, lettuce extracts have been used from the time of the Roman Empire as agents with sedative and sleep-inducing properties. Lettuce actually does have a hypnotic substance in it called lactucin, which is what makes lettuce taste a little bitter. But you don't know if it actually works until you put it to the test, and it works in toads. But it also works in rodents. Sleep in both mice and rats is enhanced by romaine lettuce. They used romaine since it has a higher lactucin content compared to other lettuces. OK, but does it work in people? About 10 years ago, a study was published in which insomnia sufferers were randomized to receive lettuce seed oil, oil extracted from lettuce seeds. Within a week, about 70% of those in the lettuce seed oil group said their insomnia very much or much improved, compared to only 20% in the placebo control group. The researchers concluded that lettuce seed oil was found to be a useful, safe sleeping aid in geriatric patients suffering from sleeping difficulties. They chose to study older individuals because insomnia affects surprisingly 20 to 40% of older adults at least a few nights a month. You think that's bad? Sleep disturbances can plague as many as nearly 8 out of 10 women during pregnancy. Of course, there's lots of different sleeping pills, but they may endanger the fetus or mother. For example, doctors frequently prescribe Ambien for pregnant women who have trouble sleeping, but Ambien use is associated with a wide range of adverse pregnancy outcomes, like low birth weight babies, uh, premature birth, and cesarean section. And the use of Valium during pregnancy has been linked to birth defects, including limb deficiencies. There has to be a better way. What about trying? Lettuce. Uh, the lettuce oil study had a number of limitations. For example, it was only single-blind, meaning the researchers knew who was on the lettuce supplements and who was on placebo, which could have introduced some bias. But the researchers essentially said, give us a break. right? Big Pharma has billions to spend on research. No one wants to fund studies on lettuce. Finally, we got a double-blind, placebo-controlled study, but this time on a whole food, not just a lettuce seed extract. Yeah, but how do you come up with a placebo lettuce? How are you going to hide who gets lettuce and who doesn't? Well, you can't fit a head of lettuce into a capsule, but you can fit whole lettuce seeds. And here we go. A double-blind, randomized, placebo-controlled trial on lettuce seeds for pregnancy-related insomnia. A hundred pregnant women with insomnia were randomized to receive capsules containing either a quarter teaspoon of ground lettuce seeds or a placebo for two weeks, and those on the lettuce seeds saw a significant improvement in the sleep quality index score uh, compared to the placebo, with no reported side effects. More than 50% of men in their 50s, and 70% or more of men in their 60s, suffer from benign prostatic hypertrophy, or BPH, otherwise known as an enlarged prostate. This can result in burdensome lower urinary tract symptoms, such as having to get up frequently at night to pee, Current medical treatments are clinically effective, but their efficacy is compromised by side effects and low compliance rates. Symptoms include sexual dysfunction, high-grade prostate cancer, and depression. No wonder there's poor compliance. And when medication treatment fails, surgical procedures are considered, such as transurethral resection of the prostate. There has got to be a better way. Population studies suggest that low intake of animal protein and high intake of fruits and vegetables may be protective, but not just cutting down on any animal protein. Eggs and poultry seem to be the worst, along with refined grains, but no association was found for red meat or dairy. Population studies aside, are there any foods that have been put to the test? 
there have been more than 30 randomized control trials on the herb saw palmetto, and it's been found to be totally useless. Evidently, cranberries were used by Native Americans to treat urinary ailments, but you don't know until you put them to the test. Uh, now, when they say dried cranberries, they're not talking about those sugary, oily craisins, but rather just straight whole cranberry powder. And significant improvements were seen in BPH symptoms, quality of life, and all urination parameters for just about a teaspoon a day of powdered cranberries. So we know a teaspoon works, but what about a third of a teaspoon, or a sixth of a teaspoon? They also helped. The results from that one teaspoon of powdered cranberries from the last study would equate to this. Now, this study used a supplement because it was funded by the supplement company, but it, the supplement is just straight cranberry powder, so you might as well just buy it in bulk for much cheaper and just add it to a smoothie or something. What about using a berry that's a little tastier, like drinking purple grape juice? No benefit whatsoever. In a previous video, I talked about the use of flax seeds, which may have a therapeutic efficacy comparable to that of commonly used drugs, with only good side effects. OK, so what about other seeds? Pumpkin seeds have evidently been used in folk medicine as a remedy for prostate disorders for centuries, and in a petri dish they can cut the growth of BPH prostate cells in half. Scientists have also injected pumpkin seed extracts into rabbits, but what about people? Pumpkin seed oil appears to help with prostate issues. When pitted head-to-head -head against the drug prozosin, it seemed to work as well as the pill. The same when it was head-to-head -head against the drug terazosin. Uh, what they didn't have, though, is a placebo group. It would have been nice to see how well the pumpkin seed oil supplements did against placebo. And Hey, in an ideal world, I'd love to also see a group just given whole pumpkin seeds themselves, and boom, there it is. More than a thousand men were randomized, either a pumpkin seed extract, a placebo, or just about a tablespoon a day of plain pumpkin seeds. The study was funded by the drug company that made the supplement, but the supplement flopped. It was no better than placebo, but the pumpkin seeds themselves worked. The supplement appeared to reduce symptoms, but not better than placebo. However, just the plain old seeds did. So it wasn't just some compound extracted from the oil. And in fact, we've since learned that even an oil-free extract seemed to work. Bottom line, the researchers concluded, is that pumpkin seed could be recommended for BPH patients with mild to moderate symptoms. This conclusion was echoed by the European equivalent of the FDA. Pumpkin seeds can be used for the relief of lower urinary tract symptoms related to an enlarged prostate after more serious conditions have been excluded by a medical doctor. Worldwide, physical inactivity accounted for more than 10 million years of healthy life lost, but what we eat accounts for nearly 20 times that. Unhealthy diets shave hundreds of millions of disability-free years off of people's lives every year. What are the worst aspects of our diets? Four out of the five of the deadliest dietary traps involve not eating enough of certain foods, not eating enough whole grains, not eating enough fruits, not eating enough nuts and seeds, and not eating enough vegetables. But our most fatal flaw is too much salt. That's on the order of 15 times deadlier than diets too high in soda, for example, just to keep things in perspective. There remains no single more effective public health action related to nutrition than the reduction of sodium in the diet. This is why national and international health organizations have called for warning labels on, on salt packets and salt shakers, with messages like, you know, too much sodium in the diet causes high blood pressure and increases risk of stomach cancer, stroke, heart disease, and kidney disease. Limit your use. Salt also increases inflammation. For example, sodium intake is associated with increased disease activity in multiple sclerosis, an inflammatory autoimmune nerve condition, about three to four times the exacerbation rate in those with medium or high sodium intakes compared to those getting less than a teaspoon of salt total in a day. Just as you can see, higher sodium levels in the tissues of those who suffer from lupus, another serious inflammatory autoimmune disease, you can correlate high sodium levels in the spinal cord of MS patients with the disease and decreased structural integrity. Where is sodium found, though? Or really crappy food, so it's hard to know if increased salt intake is just a marker for a bad diet overall. 
But what we do know is that salt and high blood pressure are cause and effect. How? Because we have more than 100 randomized controlled trials demonstrating that if you cut down on added salt, your blood pressures fall, and the more you cut down, the better. Part of the mechanism may actually be the damage salt may do to your microbiome, the, the friendly flora in your gut. And no wonder. Our bodies evolved only to handle about 750 mg a day. The American Heart Association says we should stay under at least twice that about, but we're eating more than four times what's natural. And it's only getting worse, increasing over the last decade. Anyone care to guess what percentage of Americans exceed the 1,500 mg upper limit recommendation? 98.8%, and that was more than a decade ago. The vast majority of U.S. adults consume too much sodium, and at the same time too little potassium, a mineral that lowers blood pressure. Less than 2% of U.S. adults consume the recommended daily minimum intake of potassium. So more than 98% of Americans eat potassium-deficient diets. This deficiency is even more striking when comparing our current intake with that of our ancestors, who consumed large amounts of dietary potassium. We evolved getting probably more than 10,000 mg a day. The recommendation is to get around at least half that, yet most of us don't even come anywhere close. Put the two guidelines together, and sodium and potassium goals are currently met by less than 0.015% of the U.S. population. So we're talking close to 99.99% non-compliance, as in only 1 in 6,000 Americans even hits the recommended guidelines. What about using potassium-based salt substitutes. Instead of using sodium chloride salt, why not shake on some potassium chloride? Seems a little too good to be true. I mean, same salty taste, but you're reducing sodium while at the same time increasing your potassium intake? Uh, is there a catch? Are potassium-based salt substitutes safe, effective? We'll find out next. Of all the terrible things about our diets, high dietary sodium intake, high salt intake, is the leading risk, estimated to be causing millions of deaths every year, killing millions mainly through adverse effects on blood pressure, an increased risk of stroke, heart attack, and kidney damage. Hypertension, high blood pressure, is still called the silent and invisible killer because it really causes symptoms, but is one of the most powerful independent predictors of some of our leading causes of death. We evolved consuming a diet very rich in potassium and low in sodium, but today this pattern has been completely reversed. This flip reflects a shift from traditional plant-based diets, high in potassium and low in sodium, a shift from fruits, greens, roots, and tubers, to salty processed foods stripped of potassium, which is considered a nutrient of public health concern, because 98% of the U.S. population doesn't even reach the recommended minimum daily intake of potassium, as I mentioned in the last video. And low potassium intake itself is implicated in high blood pressure and cardiovascular disease, yet few physicians actually think about proposing their patients eat more foods that are potassium-rich, like fruits and vegetables, to better control blood pressure, even though several meta-analyses have now confirmed that high potassium intake appears to reduce the risk of stroke. There's even a reduction in stroke risk independent of blood pressure effects, consistent with other protective effects of potassium, such as reducing clot formation, uh, reducing hardening of the arteries, reducing the generation of free radicals. Higher sodium intake is associated with a 20% increased risk of dying prematurely, where higher potassium intake was associated with a 20% reduced risk of dying prematurely. Yeah, but sodium is found in crappy processed foods, while potassium is concentrated in healthy foods like beans and greens, so having you know, low sodium intake and high potassium intake may just be a marker for a more healthful diet, more plant foods, and less crap. How do we know sodium is cause and effect bad? Because randomized controlled trials show sodium reduction leads to blood pressure reduction, just like there are randomized controlled trials showing that if you give people extra potassium, you can bring down their blood pressures as well. So what about using potassium chloride to salt your food rather than sodium chloride? That's what's found in these zero-sodium salt substitutes. Potassium chloride is a naturally occurring mineral salt, which is obtained the same way we get regular sodium salt. Since we get too much sodium and not enough potassium, this would seem to make potassium chloride a win-win solution. Now, whole healthy plant foods would be the best way to increase potassium intake. 
Fruits and vegetables have all sorts of other good things in them besides potassium, but we have 10 studies now, randomized controlled trials showing that just swapping in some potassium chloride for regular salt can lead to significant reductions in blood pressure in people with hypertension, suggesting that salt substitutes may even help prevent hypertension as well. Uh, we know salt substitutes can lower blood pressure, but does it actually decrease the incidence of hypertension, and more importantly, disease endpoints like stroke and mortality? You don't know until you put it to the test. In a randomized controlled trial, households had their salt replaced with just a quarter potassium chloride. At that level, most people either can't tell the difference or even prefer the salt with the potassium mixed in. OK, but did it actually do any good? The use of even the quarter salt substitute was associated with cutting the risk of developing hypertension in half. OK, but what about actually following people out to see if there's any change in the risk of dying from cardiovascular disease? Five kitchens in a veteran's retirement home were randomized into two groups. For about two and a half years, salting meals with regular salt, or unbeknownst to the cooks in the diners, a 50-50 blend of potassium chloride. Those in the half-potassium group cut their risk of dying from cardiovascular disease by about 40% and lived up to nearly a year longer. The life expectancy difference at age 70 was equivalent to that which would have naturally occurred in 14 years, meaning that just switching to half potassium salt appeared to effectively make people more than a decade younger when it came to risk of death. As we speak, there's a massive randomized controlled trial wrapping up in China, involving 600 villages and more than 20,000 people that'll give us an idea of just how low we can drop stroke risk with this strategy. Uh, China is perfect because up to 75% of their sodium intake comes from salt they add in the home kitchen or dining room, whereas most sodium in the American diet comes prepackaged in the meat and processed foods we buy, though certainly the food companies could switch over themselves. Why haven't they? And why haven't more people embraced these salt substitutes, if they work well and can taste just as good? We could be achieving the benefits of a high-potassium paleolithic diet without the toxicity. So, is salt substitution ready for prime time or what? Um, what about safety? Yes, there are convincing arguments about the benefits, but what about the risks? Like, uh, you know, the quote-unquote inclusion of potentially fatal salt substitutes in the food supply? Uh, wait, what? Uh, we'll talk about the potential downsides next. Based on how we evolve, the optimum dietary potassium intake likely greatly exceeds current and even recommended intakes. The problem is we replace many of the potassium-rich plant foods we used to stuff our faces with, like fruits, leafy greens, and other vegetables, including roots and tubers, with calorie-dense junk stripped not only of fiber, but also potassium, such as you know, added fats and sugars. So in a traditional largely plant-based diet, potassium content is high and sodium content is low. But now, high blood pressure is the second leading cause of death in the world, killing more than 10 million people a year, second only to unhealthy diets the number one killer of humanity. We can improve both by eating more whole healthy plant foods like beans and greens, which are packed with potassium, which lowers blood pressure. But since most of us are getting too much sodium along with too little potassium, what about using salt substitutes? After all, the most commonly used salt substitute is potassium chloride, so you'd be swapping out sodium for potassium. And it works. Based on a meta-analysis of more than a dozen randomized controlled trials, replacing sodium chloride with potassium chloride lowers blood pressure. And most of the trials involve just swapping out regular salt for less than 30% potassium chloride, and they still got results. And at less than 30%, most people can't even tell the difference between regular salt and the potassium salt. Uh, so it can taste exactly the same and drop your blood pressures? Uh, what's the catch? Potassium chloride is generally considered as safe by the FDA, with the only major concern for healthy people being that if you go completely 100% sodium-free and use straight potassium chloride like all these, it can taste kind of funny, adding a bitter or metallic taste. I've found that it depends on what I'm seasoning with it. It works perfectly well on some things, but makes other things completely inedible. When I learned about the sodium science and threw out my salt shaker for good, within a few weeks my palate totally changed and everything tasted fine without salt. Except pesto. For some reason, pesto without salt just never tasted like it used to to me, so I, so I tried the potassium chloride salt substitute, and it worked perfectly. I, I couldn't tell the difference at all, so I had the best of both worlds. Then 
I remembered how, as a kid, I used to put a tiny sprinkle of salt on watermelon, like they do in the South, to make it even sweeter. So I tried it with potassium salt, and almost gagged. <laughs> so it's definitely not for everything. The reason healthy people don't have to worry about getting too much potassium is that our kidneys just pee out the excess. OK, but that's with potassium in food. What about supplements? No adverse effects have been shown for long-term intakes of potassium supplements as high as 3,000 mg a day. And in fact, blood levels of potassium are maintained in the normal range by healthy kidneys even when potassium intake is increased to approximately 15,000 mg a day, which is no surprise since we evolved eating so many healthy plant foods, so many fruits and vegetables, that the normal, natural potassium intake for the human species may be on the order of 15,000 mg a day. Basically, uh, the normal range for potassium levels in the blood is between 3.5 and 5 and you start to worry when it starts creeping up towards 6. But give people potassium supplements, like all the salt substitution trials that have been giving study subjects an average of about 2,000 mg of potassium a day, and blood levels only go up uh, 0.14, so they might go up from 4 to 4.14, not something that would push you into trouble. Uh, now, there's a limit. If you have a quote-unquote massive banana eating habit, you could bump your potassium from normal to above 6, but that was evidently from years of not eating much of anything except up to 20 bananas a day. Eating 10 pounds of carrots every day is also probably not a good idea. That's like 75 carrots in one day, which you could only do with a juicer, which is what this person attempted to do as part of a quack cancer cure. What about overdoing salt substitutes? This report from the 1940s was on lithium poisoning from the use of salt substitutes. Why? Because lithium chloride was used as a salt substitute. Jesus! Uh, but what about potassium chloride, which is what's used today? There is one fatal case of someone who committed suicide by downing a little more than a tablespoon of a potassium chloride salt substitute. That doesn't seem like a lot, just a tablespoon? I mean, how can we keep that on the shell as if only a tablespoon will kill you? Well, even less than that of regular salt taken at once can kill you too. In fact, salt water ingestion was evidently a traditional method of suicide in ancient China, though these days one may be more likely to die that way from abusive religious practices. Having said all that, there are a small number of the population who may run into problems, primarily those with severely impaired kidney function. That's why there's been such a reluctance to push potassium-based salt substitutes on a population level. If your kidneys can't regulate your potassium, then you can definitely run into a serious issue. And we're talking about folks with known kidney disease, diabetes, since diabetes can lead to kidney damage, severe heart failure, those on medications that impair potassium excretion, older adults, and individuals with adrenal insufficiency. If you aren't sure, if you're at risk, ask your doctor about getting your kidney function tested. Ironically, potassium is so good at reducing deaths from high blood pressure, even among those with kidney disease, using potassium chloride salt substitutes would probably still save more lives despite the risk. Traditional dietary recommendations to kidney patients limited the intake of fruits and vegetables because of their high potassium content. However, this paradigm is rapidly changing due to the multiple benefits derived from a fundamentally plant-based diet. A whole food plant-based diet may even ameliorate chronic kidney disease. There's increasing evidence that a whole food plant-based diet may offer benefits like slowing the progression of chronic kidney disease and delaying kidney failure. So the practice of restricting dietary potassium in kidney patients should really be reserved for patients with documented hyperkalemia, a potassium level of 6 or higher, because the key to halting the progression of chronic kidney disease may in fact lie in the produce aisle. In 2019, Dr. David Katz and colleagues, including one of my favorite researchers, David Jenkins, published a public health case for modernizing the definition of protein quality. The prevailing definition seems to have more to do with biochemistry than the net effects on human health. The popular concept that protein is good and the more the better, coupled with a protein quality definition that favors animal protein, fosters the impression that eating more meat, eggs and dairy is desirable, uh, preferable. But this is directly opposed to nutrition guidelines that are instead trying to push more plants. 
Although protein malnutrition is still prevalent in many areas of the world, it is exceedingly rare in the industrialized world, where the most formidable public health threat is not something like quash your core, protein calorie malnutrition, but from chronic diseases. In 2016, a landmark study was published out of Harvard involving more than 100,000 people that found that replacing animal protein with plant protein was associated with lower risk of dying prematurely. The worst seemed to be processed meat, like bacon, as well as egg protein, the egg whites. But swapping in even just 3% plant protein for any of the animal proteins— processed meat, unprocessed meat, chicken, fish, eggs, or dairy— was associated with a significantly lower risk of, arguably the most important endpoint of all, death. Yeah, but how do we know it's the protein? The researchers adjusted for factors such as saturated fat intake, which suggested it wasn't just the animal fat. OK, but how does your body even know the difference between protein from a plant and protein from an animal? I mean, isn't protein protein? No. Unlike animal protein, plant protein is generally low in branched-chain amino acids, for example, and decreased consumption of branched-chain amino acids improves metabolic health. It could be the IGF-1, a cancer-promoting growth hormone that is boosted by so-called high-quality animal protein intake, though. We suspect the IGF-1 connection is cause and effect, since people who are born to have higher IGF-1 levels, regardless of what they eat, do appear to suffer higher rates of killers, like type 2 diabetes and heart disease. Or it could be something the Harvard researchers didn't control for, such as toxic pollutants like dioxins and PCBs, since they tend to accumulate up the food chain in cattle, pigs, chickens, and fish, and therefore end up on our plates. So plant-based protein also stands as an important step to lower the body burden of harmful pollutants. If you don't think 100,000 people are enough, how about 400,000 people? The NIH AARP study is the largest diet cohort study in history. And again, simply swapping 3% of calories from various animal protein sources with plant protein was associated with 10% decreased overall mortality. And you get even twice that benefit if you get rid of eggs, too. Uh, that's not a surprise, since egg consumption is associated with a higher risk of developing cardiovascular disease. Put all the studies together on dietary protein intake and mortality, and people who eat more protein tend to live shorter lives, but this is mainly driven by the harmful association of animal protein. Plant protein intake is inversely associated with mortality, meaning those who eat more plant protein tend to live longer lives. More animal protein may mean more mortality, whereas more plant protein is correlated with less mortality. So the best of both worlds would be to increase the intake of plant protein in place of animal protein. In other words, as another 2020 meta-analysis concluded, persons should be encouraged to increase their plant protein intake to potentially decrease their risk of death.